thank you, Juliet. Um, good morning. Um, so please, uh, please join me. Molly Conroy. M Molly is, I'm going to let her say a little bit about herself. She's a professor at the University of Utah. Mark Cohen, who greets us from across the pond from England. And Randy Forker from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. So I'll just have each of you just say, um, give us a few, a couple of seconds on who you are and what you bring to this panel. Um, it's a tremendous expertise from various perspectives about patient engagement that I want to talk about a little bit about. Uh, good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you for the invitation, Laura and AHA. Um, my name is Molly Conroy, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Utah. I recently relocated to Salt Lake City from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where Laura and I uh, worked together for many years at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I feel like there have been a lot of interesting comments and conversations about primary care. I am a real live primary care provider, I'm now practicing in Salt Lake City, and I'm also the chief of general internal medicine at the University of Utah, so I also collaborate with and supervise other um, primary care providers who work in inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, the other perspective I bring to the panel is I am a clinician researcher, and most of my research has focused on um, how to <coughs> implement lifestyle change in primary care settings, and many of those studies have used um, technology. So that is the other perspective I bring to the panel. Thank you. Mark? Hi. Um, good morning. At least I think it's morning. Pretty sure it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, my background is um, I've worked across sort of academia and um, also the CPG sector, um, I think that's how you would term it here, and, um, and also um, more recently in the, in the world of startup where I've just started up my own uh, organization. Uh, and I also um, have a position at Imperial College in London in the preventive cardiology group. Um, I, I'm, my perspective here is to, to be able to give my uh, experience of behavior change as it relates both in each of those different sectors, and that's what I hope to bring today. Randy? Hi, everybody. I'm Randy Foraker, and like Laura and Molly, I recently relocated. I was in Columbus, Ohio the last time that I saw a lot of you. I was at Ohio State there in the College of Public Health. I'm trained as an epidemiologist. I recently moved to the School of Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. And my role there is to be the population health informatics expert in the new Institute for Informatics. And my research primarily uses electronic health record data in order to track health outcomes. My other area of expertise and what I bring to this panel is developing and implementing and testing apps that are integrated into the electronic health record in order to motivate behavior change, really in patients and providers. And so I'll talk a bit about that today. So you can see we have a tremendous range of expertise. And so the focus of this panel is behavior change and engagement. Engagement is sort of the replacement of that kind of dirty word adherence. Engagement has come into the lexicon, I think, as we've added technology to healthcare. It's very similar to that medication. If we have really wonderful devices, electronic records, but if the patient or the provider does not use them, then we don't really not see any outcome. And several speakers have talked about the long-term engagement with some of these apps that um, that keep flooding uh, the field. So um, in my opinion, this is probably the most important session of this meeting because, again, if the provider or the patient is not using what industry is developing, then we are not making progress. So as you can see, the panel brings perspective from the provider as well as from the patient. Usually the onus has been on the patient in terms of engagement, but today we can actually address how the provider is engaging and also working with the patient to get the patient engaged. So we decided as a group to have three questions that the panel will address in order to deliver probably the most important content to you. And the very first question we've asked them to address is to talk about the successes they have experienced in implementing whatever their role is and the use of technology, and what are the elements that contributed to that success. So Molly, would you like to start this? Sure. Um, so again, 
just from where I sit in primary care, um, you know, the ubiquitous technology that we have, and you could have a whole tale of two cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times about this, is the electronic health record. So as a primary care physician, that is the technology that I in interface with every time that I go into clinic, and even on days that I'm not directly seeing patients, I am constantly checking in with the EHR to see what's going on. So one of the um, kind of insights that I had when I was doing some of my research at the University of Pittsburgh is, is that if I'm constantly checking in with the EHR, wouldn't it be interesting to try to implement a lifestyle intervention in this space? Um, over the course of my career as a primary care physician, we've also now have a patient-facing version of the EHR, which is sometimes called the personal health record or PHR. So patients can send me messages, they can send me requests, we can interact um, through this, um, through this um, electronic health record. So what I kind of started with an idea, we actually um, developed an intervention that was delivered both through the electronic health record to the primary care physician and through the personal health record to the primary care patient with the question specifically of asking, can we help patients through EHR-based self-monitoring and coaching um, maintain intentional weight loss after they have um, had some initial success with lifestyle change. So the purpose of today is not to kind of talk about the results of clinical trials, but for me that was kind of a success. First of all, that we were able to build that type of a platform to take it from an idea to a real tool. Um, we were able to complete a clinical trial and had some really promising results. But the thing that was most interesting to me thinking about behavior change and long-term engagement is could we get both patients and physicians to buy into this and to actually engage with the tool tools that we developed. And we were able to some extent. Um, the funder of the project, which was ARC, was very interested, especially in workflow, which other people have mentioned today, and sort of whether this would be disruptive in a negative way um, to the providers and thinking about the provider's perspective. So we actually have collected a lot of information on that. So. Um, I, I'm happy to talk more about that um, and some of the things we've learned from that study, but I think for me it was exciting just to see that this tool that is ubiquitous, that pe I think a lot of primary care providers have like a love-hate relationship with the electronic health record to see that we actually were able to do something innovative with it that supported lifestyle change. So, Randy, you also addressed on electronic health records, so maybe you would like to add to what Molly is just Sure, absolutely. So, I've done a, I've taken a similar approach to Molly, and um, my research team and I at Ohio State developed an app around Life Simple 7, and you've heard people speak about that the American Heart Association seven modifiable behaviors and factors to improve health. And five of those factors can be found in the electronic health record using medication data and laboratory data and also point of care data. And what I mean by that is the heightened weight that's taken the day of the appointment, the blood pressure that's taken the day of the appointment. So. Getting back to your question about a success, one of our technological successes was using a platform, the electronic health record, where really the data go to die, to be able to pull out data <laughs> elements that are important to the patient and bring them to life at the point of care and present them in such a way that they're interactive and visually interesting and enhance the user experience during the patient provider encounter. So this app has slider bars and buttons to show the patient how changes in their smoking status or changes in their physical activity can improve their overall cardiovascular health. We had success with the personal health record as well, gathering data from the patient on physical activity and diet, and those data were also automatically incorporated into this visual display at the point of care. Now, one of our lessons learned was because we worked with providers when we developed this tool, and we talked to patients when we de developed this tool, and we wanted information from our users to see and find out what they wanted to see at the point of care and what would be useful to them. And I think that that is one of the main successes of the tool is that it was able to enhance shared decision making at the point of care because it was a tool that the 
provider and the patient wanted, and it was delivered at the opportune time. To give you an example, providers told me, I do not need an alert or any sort of reminder to be thrown at me as soon as I open up the health record because they get bombarded with alerts at that time point. So we shifted when this app was available to be when the provider navigated to the order section of the electronic health record. And then that was compatible with any orders that they needed to make for blood pressure medication or for laboratory tests or for weight management counseling at that time. So it was really the opportune time to deliver it. So the users actually used it. And it improved the behavior of patients and those factors among patients um, over a one year period. Very nice. So Mark, you're not using or focused on electronic health records, so could you add your perspective more from the use of mobile technology, I think? Sure. Yeah, so um, so my perspective is, I mean, I would say patient, but after the previous presentation, I really should say person, because um, I completely agree with that. I mean, we are all people in the end. Um, uh, back in 2006, I was a uh, resident in Boston University, just up the street there, in um, working with investigators from the Framingham Heart Study. And one of the things that we discussed was just how difficult it was to communicate to patients the output of risk scores and why you'd even want to do that. So you know, telling somebody that they've got a 10% chance of cardiovascular disease is not something which is overwhelmingly going to drive behavior change. And um, my background is a, um, I'm a psychologist by training and, and would never talk in that way to, to a patient, I don't think, um, unless I was describing a threshold that required treatment. Um, and then once you've told somebody you're at high risk, it's a slightly different conversation. Um, and playing around with the risk scores and playing around with the formats and the the the, um, the ways that you present this, we, we came up with a concept that we published in 2008 with the last Framingham Risk Score um, called Heart Age. And Heart Age was taken up, uh, has, it has been used extensively in, in different places around the world now. Um, so I think it's a modest success in that the dissemination of this has got some traction both uh, in the US, we work with the Center for Disease Control on mapping heart ages across the US and showing that certain parts of the country were, uh, obviously had younger hearts than, than others. In fact, I think Utah was one of the youngest in the entire US. Um, but also working with the National Health Service in the UK, um, we have incorporated it into the NHS Health Check Program. We've used it, we've used the concept to get people more likely to attend a health check program, um, because fundamentally, um, and, and this comes to my, I guess, both psychology training, but also CPG training, is you've got to look for a fundamental insight um, about human beings and that you know, people don't want to be older. Um, it has a lot of connotations associated with it. and. At the same time, by hooking that to something which was already a validated risk score, like the Framingham risk score at the time and other risk scores since then, um, you've got the credibility that means that a physician, a physician can have a conversation with a patient and understand what it means, and the patient understands something very simply because they're either older or younger and no one wants to be older. Um, and so we saw it start to drive behavior change. Uh, we measured um, emotional reactivity to the concept, and we found that the emotional response to that information was critical in delivering behavior change and then uh, about two years ago we finished the, the um, uh, a randomized controlled trial where simply presenting people at a health check program with the uh, the hard age concept versus a standard risk score we saw um, 12 months later reductions in blood pressure reductions in cholesterol and BMI and smoking rates and that was just from a simple presentation now we know that it's going to be much better if we have a continuous engagement with individuals and show how making changes can take these uh, can make you know bring your heart age down um, but you know the research is not complete on that just yet um, but what's interesting about that is it showed that a single engagement actually could drive behavior change it doesn't necessarily have to be about continuous engagement in order to kick off a process that, that delivers change 
Very nice, thank you. So I think one of the other issues is what are the challenges? You know, I think we are all considering that there are many challenges, whether it's from the provider or working with the patient or the person who is trying to maintain their health. So maybe Randy, would you like to start off talking a little bit about what's particularly maybe one significant challenge that you had to face? And, and, and then I'd like to talk, eventually then talk maybe about opportunities to maybe remove some of those challenges. Absolutely. So um, I'm encouraged by Mark's findings that one um, one encounter with these data can improve um, behaviors and perhaps sustain behavior change over the longer term. Because of what I do at the point of care, developing technologies and, and interventions and testing them, I do think a lot about where individuals live, work, and play and how we can continue to spread the behavior change message to them when they're not during when they're not there for a 10 minute encounter with their primary care provider, for example. And so what other data um, and other devices can we use to reach people where they live, work, and play? And then also another challenge, I know you said just one challenge, but another challenge is um, harnessing all of those data in the clinic so that we can learn more about the patient. Um, at the time that they're at the time that they spend with their healthcare provider, because they might be using a continuous glucose monitor or monitoring their blood <laughs> pressures at home. And earlier this morning, someone alluded to the millions of data points that one patient can produce. How do we make sense of all of those data and figure out what's clinically meaningful? and bring that to the point of care. Because a lot of these data that are being collected outside of the clinic have huge implications for, um, for the patient's health. Molly, would you like to address this? And, and I guess also, you know, it's there's a tremendous volume of patient-generated data, and it's, again, the acceptance or the uh, willingness of the provider to um, do in this role to yeah. review those data and take the time to incorporate that in counseling the patient about their progress. Yeah. I, I think since um, Randy picked more than one uh, challenge, I will also, <laughs> but I'm going to pick one from the patient perspective, and I'm going to pick one more from the provider perspective. So I think, um, you know, pro provider burnout is like a big buzzword right now. At my new institution, we actually have a chief wellness officer at the University of Utah. This is the first time, and I've been at a variety of academic uh, medical centers across the country over my years of training um, that there has been a chief wellness officer. And one of the metrics that I know that they are collaborating with our chief medical information officer at the University of Utah is looking at sort of when physicians are on the electronic health record and how much after hours use is, is happening. So so the idea that we, even though this is an essential tool and it is the, I would argue, primary technology that we use in primary care, um, it it is also kind of something that is perhaps contributing to the um, the kind of physician burnout that we are seeing, unfortunately, in um, in some types of providers. Um, so I think that as much as we felt like we were successful with maintain and engaging the physicians and kind of being up to date with looking at their patients' um, lifestyle information, there was definitely a saturation point too. And many of the providers, even though they said that they liked their tools, when we asked them how often they checked to see, for example, whether their physicians, um, par pardon me, their patients' um, weight and other health metrics, how often they went into the chart and looked at them themselves, we found that it was very negligible. So it it's a little challenging to me when I hear about ideas or platforms for putting more um, lifestyle-related data into the electronic health record. It sounds like a very appealing idea, but I know that physicians right now are challenged with even just getting through the basics of the documentation and other tasks they need to do in the EHR. So I think thinking about dashboard functionality, thinking about mindfully how that could be done is, is one thing. The other thing that we um, learned from Maintain is that, you know, as we thought, the patients who got feedback on the data that they entered through the personal health record actually did better with their weight and other outcomes comes than the than the folks who didn't get feedback. So the challenge, I think, from the patient side is people want that personal touch. Our, pa our, um, 
our people, um, they are not patients or participants, but our people who got coached and got feedback really engaged more and did better. But I think the challenge now is how to scale that and how to, how to create that personal touch to keep people engaged in a way that's going to be um, compatible with the resources that we have in primary care settings. Good point to follow up on about how do we um, manage all these. I'd like to follow up on Edmund next. Mark, would you like to add something to this about the challenges? Yeah, I mean, very briefly, I think from the patient or person's perspective, um, obviously there's also you know, a lot of demand in terms of generating and inputting data. And we've covered a lot of that in previous sessions and people have talked about you know, simpler ways, uh, ways to automate some of these things, ways to automate some of the feedback which comes from the physician um, actually is a, 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 sta a stakeholder in the definition of algorithms that can feed back personally to, to, to patients is, is one way we can take out some of that. Um, but there will always be some questions that will arise that will need to be dealt with. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things from a patient, or per, must keep stopping this, uh, saying person. this, person <laughs> point of view, um, is I think people are interested in interrogating their own um, self when they're generating insights about themselves and they learn something that's interesting as opposed to, oh, that's great, I did 5,000 steps and I need to do 10. Um, that when you're learning something about yourself, so um, one of the areas that we've sort of expanded into is to try and incorporate some of the more, um, it's been called different things, softer side, um, emotional side, um, issues which really impact upon people's ability to perform some of these lifestyle changes, which we know are very difficult. So, um, you know, we, we, we know, for example, when we ask people about their overall life satisfaction and we ask about stress, um, responses to stress, we see BMI scores, which are five units higher in those people, the worst scores and the people with the, the highest scores. And so what kind of conversation are you going to have with a physician or, or anybody else who's looking at that data with that context as opposed to just whether I've, you know, taking my meds or whether I'm... Um, you know, being physically active or not, it produces a lot of um, you know, potentially difficult conversations. But but for a for a patient to understand that and start to generate some learnings about themselves and why they're unable to perhaps take some of these um, actions, I think is something that there needs to be some kind of hybrid between what guidance that they get from their physician and what they're learning about mm -hmm. themselves. Okay, in the time we have left, and hopefully that we could open this to questions in the audience, I'd like you to address opportunities. You know, particularly thinking about all the conversations that have occurred since last evening about where are we going with technology, and so what kind of opportunities do you see that we could actually enhance um, patient, person, provider engagement, particularly sustained engagement. We, we all know that people get involved initially, but how do we sustain that? And I think that's, that's where the gap is, that's where we need to really look into the future. So, and I know Randy, you have, you're doing some innovative work, I think, maybe in looking how we can maybe reduce burden um, and exactly. enhance involvement. Exactly. So this whole idea of the quantified self and all of the data that we are collecting on ourselves and quite frankly are being collected on us every single day, um, I think making it easy for people to make the right decision is critical and we're at a, we're at a juncture where I, we can start using these data for good and, um, and as Dennis said earlier, targeted poking or targeted prodding um, to get people to make the right decisions at the right time. For example, my phone knows exactly where I am right now and my phone knows when I normally take a break and eat lunch. And so if I'm walking down the street and I can make a healthy choice about where to stop and get lunch, my phone could tell me that, right? I don't know if with Eric's example of, well, you've had ice cream for three days straight, do you really want to do that? I don't know if I want my phone telling me that, but it might be good to have that reminder to make healthier decisions. And, and again, being able to reach people where they live, work, and play and help them make better decisions even outside of the clinic. Would you like to add to that, Mark? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I've heard, heard repeatedly throughout the different sessions 
um, over the over the course of today is, is sort of this this idea that we can almost what, what's called just in time intervention or sort of just in time digital intervention where you know I've got this sort of context that I I sharing with something some system there's something about me or my psychographics that enable me to give a targeted message to to somebody and um, I think one of the from a research point of view I think what's there are there are two areas that I think we need to address one is um, better definition of what behavioral strategies come at these different time points and um, there's a lot of work being done on coding behavioral strategies that are used in digital technology and um, behavioral taxonomies things which can be reduced no more like you know when we talk about lifestyle change or which of the hundred plus behavioral strategies that we can deploy are used at which given point in time I think the second area that we need to do a lot more and um, deeper analysis on is is the extent to which we define engagement, what engagement means, how much engagement do we need <laughs> to deliver the outcomes that we need, because we may find that you know, um, the number of page views is not a great predictor of whether people um, you know, increase their physical activity or not, but it might just be that the efficiency with which they interact with, um, with, with websites or, or mobile phone technology uh, is the key metric. So overlaying outcomes with engagement measures, and uh, I, I think that's, that's a key a key thing to do to, to sort of get get right and then once we know what the behavioral strategies are that we put in place for those different phases of behavior change and we can start coding them so people can replicate them uh, then we're going to be in a much better position to understand what to recommend to people in these different phases so yeah so it sounds like so more precise measurement of actually each intervention i think right now we're guilty of delivering many interventions and not quite sure what is effective. Yeah, and so yeah. I think, so it sounds like you're on the track there to actually clearly measure the outcome of each very specific contact maybe with a patient right. through technology. And then through that, I think maybe going on to algorithms and artificial, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to better direct our interventions. So Molly, have, have you addressed any of this and we're looking to that in the future to taking your work to that? Please. I think you know the comment that I have gotten most frequently when I have spoken to date about the results of this kind of exciting intervention we just did is like, well, how is this going to work in my community? I just went down to Texas last week and talked to a group of physicians who work in a, um, you know, a, a Latino community that you know go to um, clinics that have a lot. Um, less resources than the clinics where our program was implemented. So for me, that's the opportunity. It's a kind of an opportunity that's also a challenge at the what next is like, how do we reach other segments of the population? I really appreciated Nancy's comments this morning about how do we take this globally to populations that traditionally have not been served. Um, my new perspective living in, um, I learned a new uh, phrase when I moved to Utah that not just rural communities, but frontier communities. I mean, we have cardiologists from our university who fly out to these remote communities, but how can we use the technology to also be in those communities, especially from um, you know the long-term engagement perspective um, of kind of having ongoing relationships with people. So I see that as kind of a, and maybe it's a, it's an opportunity that's wrapped around a challenge, but I'm an optimist and I think that technology and um, kind of the desire to get into all communities will, will get us there. You bring up an excellent point that not only do we have limited knowledge in the general population about engagement, but we have very, very little, we're really lacking diverse populations. Um, some diverse populations. Yeah. So I think we have about two and a half minutes left. Is there a que question from the audience? Sure, I'm, I, it's hard for me to see, so just yeah. please go ahead. And, and Dr. Corley mentioned something about the burnout, and actually based on my experience in primary care, I agree it's the EMI is one of the worst burnouts I have I've seen. And my question would be, wouldn't be, are, maybe we're very worried in primary care about getting the data that we're actually delivering worse care, because from the practices I've been to, I see that the, the doctor is three minutes with the patient and 15 minutes in the EMR. So wouldn't there be something to do, like, I know the data is very important, but maybe we need to adjust the system to better? 
Oh, um, that's kind of a big question. I'm going to take it first because I felt like it was addressed to me in primary care. I mean, about kind of radically redesigning how we kind of interface with the computer. And there's a computer now in you know every room in a in a clinic, um, as opposed to I think that was not the case. I know that was not the case in the first clinic where I started my primary care training. Um, so I think there have been a lot of kind of thoughts about sort of how to have it so that the I can if you were my person, <laughs> not my patient, if you were my person, person and I was your person, your provider, um, that we would spend more of the um, actual visit talking to each other as opposed to what we do now, which is a lot of typing. Um, I, I think that that is, has to be part of it because I think we are going to get to the point where that the technology just overburdens people to the point where it's like, oh, I, I can't interact with that, much less look at more data points. I don't have a perfect answer today about sort of redesigning that system, but I think that is something that both provider people and patient people want. Any other comments? We have about 30 seconds left. You want to add to that? I, I can just add to that. I think that there's great potential with visualizations to be embedded into the electronic health record to encourage shared decision making and have the EHR not just be a vacuum that sucks in the provider during the encounter, but really as a tool to be able to enable the conversations that are supposed to be happening during that, that those precious few minutes, right? So I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for the, your excellent contributions. You have a wealth of knowledge, and I hope we can all learn from this and take this back home with our practice.